because, uh, but at the same time, we're, we're earthly, fleshly people, right? And uh, we come in and talk, we have a, a plan, and so uh, we're going to just delay our missions video to next week and our missions announcement to next week. And so Pastor Matt doesn't have to take out the flags this week, praise the Lord. And, uh, and because I feel like we just need to move right into uh, the message this morning and uh, just into where I feel God has uh, been speaking to me. And I look at these things, these moments like, like even this morning right now, we're just recording on, on one single camera because the whole, we have a system upstairs and the whole thing just cr crashed. <laughs> and we can't get it to turn back on, can't get it to do anything else. But you know what probably happened as soon as service is over, we'll go up and plug it back in and it'll come right back on and work the right way. And it's in these moments that we, we not be one hyper-spiritual, two, um, you know, whatever I guess you want to say, but in these moments that we just recognize, uh, the, there's a John that speaks, that talks about we know how to interpret the clouds and the sky and the weather, but we don't know how to interpret the things of God. And we as a people, as a church, as individuals, need to be about being able to interpret the things of God and what God is doing. I, um, last week, our, the message I had to share, just let me say thank you for the, all those who reached out uh, last week and uh, just touched base with us. Uh, it, there was a lot of just responses into what God had spoken to many in the room. And, um, and then once again, it's those moments that even as I was working on our greenhouse, that the Lord kind of gave me, gave me that picture and image of where we were at as a church, and here we are in this spring season, and uh, what is it that God is is doing? But this morning without the, I don't want to be non-spiritual, but some of you are, uh, this is all part of my message, and so I need my, I need my little laboratory to come forward here, because I'm going to teach, this is part of my teaching this morning. And if you allow me, I got to turn, I got to get my uh, temperature right here. You're like, oh, that's a great transition, Pastor. <laughs> right? But if you'll if you'll follow me here this morning, we're gonna do this. And uh, how many of you in this room like chocolate chip cookies? Yeah. Right? How many of you like chocolate chip cookies right when they come out of the oven? Yeah. How many? Okay. How many of you? There's no. We only have the one camera, so it's only on me, so nobody else can be seen. But how many of you um, still eat the cookie dough even with the egg in it? Come on. Come on, that, that's the spiritual people right there. Come on. They, and that is true faith. They are the ones that have the true faith, right? So, if you'll allow me this morning, I'm going to, um, Sugar, right? 
Praise the Lord. And when the sugar comes out of the bowl, it's even better. Some of you are like, Sonny, you need to learn how to make cookies. I mean, my grandmother used to put uh, vanilla pudding in the uh, mix. Just vanilla pudding mix in the flour makes it extra uh, soft. Did you know that? Come on, there you go. So I got my, I got my three quarters of a cup of uh, brown sugar, packed. Half, uh, 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 half a cup of white sugar, and then I'm going to add uh, a stick and a half of butter. Come on. Come on, what's her name? Uh, Paula Dean, come on. It's your hot up Paula Dean. It's always the, I've got like the, well, I used to have the big bowl until it fell out of the cupboard and broke. Oh, look at that beautiful. Isn't that amazing? Oh, there we go, okay. Oops, stop. <laughs> We're coming for the Pentecost service tonight. Some of you are like, wow, we went from really spiritual to this. Okay, welcome to Kettering. And I was a former kids pastor, but listen, it's all going to come together, and uh, we'll see how we respond. So uh, I do need, I do need uh, one full egg, and I do need a white, a white. With this one. And that one didn't work. Okay. How many times have you done that, right? Please. Oh, what did I do? I just took the yoga. Oh. Look how sad that was. See? Nobody paying attention. Pay no attention. Talk to your neighbor. Woo! Man, if you were in my class, right? What did she say? What she would say? Pandemic, we all have stuff all the time. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, you know, what's her name? Wouldn't care if you messed all that up, right? She would just say you just kind of go with it. All right, so I got all that mixed. Got my eggs. Now I'm going to take all my flour, right? Judy is loving this <laughs> back there. Remember, I do bake at home. <laughs> it's in these moments you gotta start slow on these things, otherwise it flies. Like that. And that is not the glory, that's just flour. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there it goes. Oh, it's pulling all together, Pastor Matt. It is coming together. Y'all are like, what in the world? So as you're a guest today, you're like, what, what did I walk into? <laughs> Don't worry, I do have a point. I, have, I do have a point today. My point is I'm making cookies. Okay. And finally, this morning, come on, get off there. Get off my little bit. Do that. And I've got a cup and a half of uh, semi sweet. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You heard that, right? That's like why you eat them. That's why you, we just really keep this jar underneath our cupboard and we just have to refill it because it's like sometimes you just want that little bit of sugar in it at night and you're like, oh, I'll just go get a little bit of that. Right? That's, don't tell me you people won't do that. You sneak the little bit. Okay. Oh, and the best invention about cookies that I love. Anybody have one of these little scooper things? Yeah. Right? It just gets like, look, it's like the perfect size. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing right there. Oh. Hey, she's ready. Perfect timing. I, like, I planned this. I didn't, but I, I, uh... And then we're going to stick this in the oven. And we're gonna cook it for a little while. We're gonna bake it. And I'm gonna, I need to try it first, right? Oh, yeah! Come on! Oh, yeah. Rebel. Oh, yeah. All right, can I have a timer? No. All right, can I have a timer up there? Let me 
take this off here for a moment. But, you know, these cookies, we, we love the smell of cookies. We're going to let those cook, and while, we're, while I'm teaching, these are going to start smelling up the sanctuary, smell like cookies. Come on. Praise the Lord. Uh, but while these are baking, I want to get back to my message because I think and I sense that the Lord is wanting to do something here in Kettering and that there's a stirring within this body for what he wants to do. I sense this because I'm seeing some of the results of individuals pushing in and I'm also starting to hear some chatter. I'm not talking about gossip, but what I'm talking about is chatter that says, isn't there more? I'm tired of the same old, same old. Some of this is coming because of the state of our economy and the world that we live in. And I can submit to you today that God is not limited by $5 gas prices. He's not limited by who sits in whatever town of office is. He is not limited. And that he is wanting to move. He's, he's desiring us to push in. If you look at the history of the church, and you look at when the, the market crashed back in the 20s, that was some of the biggest growth of the church in the midst of the, the pain and the mess because people came to a place where they needed to, they were looking for something. So this I know that God is wanting to move today, and even as we experience this morning in worship, that he wants to move through you and I. He wants to use us as mouthpieces and living examples, that he wants to transform our lives, our family, our churches, our cities, and our states, and our nations. You uh, saw my Facebook post even this morning. There was I posted this quote. There was an evangelist, one of the evangelists who was at the Brownsville Revival. His name was Dick Rubin. He was a Messianic Jew, meaning he gave his life to Jesus. He was a Jewish man that accepted as, Jesus as Messiah. And he would teach on the tabernacle. And I, I, have, uh, I have done... Uh, tabernacle teachings and like multiple weeks and even when I was a kids pastor we built the items of the tabernacle and I taught on them and, and uh, we had the altar of incense and the smoke and all those things talking about how it's still relevant today about what God did back in those days but he, he, he would say this he would he would always preach this that when the pattern is right that when the pattern is right the glory will fall when the pattern is right, the glory will fall. This is a phrase that has been stirring in my heart this week, especially as we approach our as Pentecost service that will be taking uh, tonight, here at 6 o'clock. And then in light of what I'm seeing and hearing from many of you, and what I'm seeing, uh, sensing that the Lord is wanting to do. Just as I'm baking these cookies today, there is a pattern or a recipe that I followed. And when I follow that recipe, the hope is that the cookies will turn out, right? As much as we follow the recipe to make the cookies, I want you to know that when the pattern is right within the kingdom, within when we uh, go after God and we follow the pattern, the glory of God will fall. See, the, the cookies take the right amount of dry ingredients to connect the correct amount of fat in the wet ingredients, the proper temperature and time. Can I submit to you today that just as we have patterns and recipes for foods that we make and plans for things that we build, that God may have a pattern or plan for what revival looks like. Revival is the moving of God's spirit. It's the rediscovery of who he is. If you have your Bible this morning or your electronic version, paper or electronic, I want to encourage you to open up to 1 Samuel chapter 7 today. We're going to talk about three verses in 1 Samuel chapter 7. And to get to there, I want to and understand this portion of Scripture. We need to understand a little bit about what was going on in the scale of this, in, in Israel at this time. Chapters 1 and 2, the, the priest Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they began to prevent the worship of God. They were all uh, priests, and Hophni and Phinehas began to prevent the, the worship of God, and that people would, would turn, that they didn't want the offerings of giving to God. Hophni and Phinehas' actions brought the people to discredit the offerings of the Lord. You move into chapter 3, where we see that God calls Samuel. You Maybe you've read this and heard it, that three times in the night, Samuel is asleep, and, and he hears his name being called out, and he goes in the other room to eat. 
Eli, the priest, and Eli, you know, like it wasn't me. And finally, after the third time, Eli realizes that the Lord must be calling Samuel. And he says to him in verse 10, he said uh, that Samuel says to uh, the Lord, when he hears him, speak, Lord, for your servants is listening. This is a, a call that is beginning to happen in Samuel's life. In chapter 4, Israel was at war with the Philistines. And they brought the Ark of the Covenant, which is the Ark of God, which was the physical presence of God. Part of the tabernacle that Moses and were, were instructed and, and it, it would hold the presence of God. There was angels on the top of the, the wings and there was a blue flame that would go between the wings representing the presence of God. And they brought this this ark into the camp and thought that it would be a good luck charm for them in their fight against the Philistines. The, the, they, Hathi and the, Phil, the Philistines for a moment stepped back, but uh, they, they went to battle, and in this battle, Hophni and Phinehas, who were Eli's children, are both killed, and then this report comes to Eli in verse 17. This marked a spiritual low point in uh, uh, I didn't tell, but, but 17, go to the verse, uh, sorry, verse 7, there you go. Then the one who brought the, uh, brought the news replied, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great slaughter among the people. And your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God has been taken. Israel had that, they were keeping it as this thing that that was their good luck charm. But when he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell off the seat backwards beside the gate and his neck was broken and he died for he was old and heavy. Thus he judged Israel for 40 years. This marked a spiritual low point that came in the nation of Israel as was evidenced by the naming of the child of Phinehas. As his wife died in childbirth, she instructed that the child, the priest child, okay, should when he was to, the priest child was delivered, that his name should be Ichabod. Ichabod is literally translated, where is the glory? As she professed that the glory of God had departed from Israel with the Ark of the Covenant of the Ark of God. So in chapter 7, we pick up the story just as the ark has been returned, but it had yet to be restored to its rightful place. Verse 1. And the men of Gareth Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadad in the, on the hill and consecrated Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord. From the day that the ark remained at Gareth Jerem, the time was long, for it was 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Verse number three, then Samuel spoke to all the house of the Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Ashtoreth from among you, and direct your hearts to the Lord, and serve him alone, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Three verses we're going to talk about today. Really, we read all three, but we're going to talk about two of them. Verse number two. As you're looking at that, it talks about that it was, it was, while it was remained there, the time was long for it was 20 years. There was a 20 year abandonment of, uh, of God's presence. For 20 years, the presence of God was not known. Could you imagine walking into a, a church and never experiencing what we experienced just even here this morning? For 20 years, you walk in, punch your card, you do your thing, and you just walk back out. And there's nothing more. There's no prophecy, there's no words, there's nothing, there, there's no healings, there's no, nothing taking place because the presence of God is void. For 20 years. First off, I'm like, 20 years, how could you let it go for 20 years? Right? But they, they lamented, and they began to look at this thing, and that word lament means that someone has died, or something that has been lost, something that has been ceased to exist, and they realized that they were broken before the Lord because this, His presence was gone. Where is His presence? There was a sense of loss, that something was missing. They were dry, they were dead. But see, this is the recipe for revival, is what my title of my sermon is this morning. 
the recipe for revival. Because the pattern for his moving, the pattern for God's moving always begins with one word, desire. In order to experience real revival, we must be willing to take a good look at our own spiritual condition and make an honest assessment of what we have and what we are missing. For 20 years, the presence of God was gone, and the people began to miss the presence and began to lament after it. Friends, we will never experience revival if we are content for things to remain as they are. If there is no hungering and thirsting for God's presence. See, we have a desire for His Word. Uh, we have to have a desire for His Word to help bring about the assessment of who we are and where we are. This morning I said, hey, we're going to make chocolate chip cookies, and some of you have not been able to think about anything else other than chocolate chip cookies. And I can tell you, standing right here with the little fence right this way, Oh my gosh. Like, I, I, could you imagine going 20 years without a chocolate chip cookie? But we'd be fine with just going and punching our clock and card at church and getting out of time and getting to do what we want to do. We have to desire His presence. We are at a place within our country, following the pandemic, that many churchgoers have stopped attending, and many don't even watch online anymore. Many are finding themselves at one point that never, they would never be that place. They would never be where revelation, either hot or cold, but you know, lukewarm. There, there's a lukewarmness of the spirit of who they are, that they, they would never be that individual. But yet here we are. So many of the church, and some people say, is this the great falling away? And I don't think it is. I think it's going to get even worse. And, and that's why we as the church, we as a people, need to desire God's presence. Amen. Revival will only happen when we are dissatisfied with our current situation to the point that we are yearning for the presence of God. The people of Israel saw their state and what they were missing. If there has ever been a time in our life when we were closer to the Lord, if you can look at your life today and look back and say, man, there are times where I felt so close to God, then I want to ask you, friend, what are you desiring today? I don't want what was there. I want what was better. I want more of what God has of even more. While we spend time at Brownsville Revival and see you know, thousands of people run to the altar. We tell the stories of people running from the balcony. I, I, I think I think we were talking last week at lunch with Ryan, and we were just talking about how people would literally run from the balcony down the stairs, and they would slide into the altar area because they literally felt like they were on the edge of going to hell. And it wasn't because some preacher stood in the front and had this eloquent sermon, but no, it was because the Spirit of God was so real in that room that you felt like you had to get right with Jesus. And if I didn't get right, am I going to miss what he's doing? Friends, I don't want what God did in Brownsville. I want what God has for us here in Kettering. And at some point, we've got to look at the fact of saying, yeah, I work my job, but my job is a, a means by which I get to serve God, and out of that, I have a desire that's greater. We can have the best kids ministry, and all these things, the best youth ministry, but moms and dads, if you don't lead the way in your house, what good is the little bit that our kids get the opportunity to experience God in this place if they don't get the opportunity to experience it at their house? We must desire the presence in God. We just must desire God. That stirs us to pray. That stirs us to have a hunger. That stirs us to move because these are vital, important matters. When the pattern is right, the glory will fall. See, the second part of this pattern, as we see from the recipe of revival in this scripture, comes from the third part of this verse, and it's the word definition. 
We have to desire, but we also have to define. We have to define what this is. Samuel spoke in verse 3 to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Asherah from among you, and direct your hearts to the Lord, and serve him alone. That's where we begin, where we start to define. Samuel begins to, to, to instruct the people of Israel, and his first comment to them provides a simple definition of what revival truly is. That if you return to the Lord with all your heart... Friends, you want to know what revival is? It's returning to the Lord with all your heart. It's about, it's about walking past all the other stuff to get to the place where God is. It's about passing by what may be good for what is great. He spoke and he said, you know what, you need to deal with these Ashtoreth pole, these Ashtoreths that you see here. And, and they were Greek gods or goddesses representing paganism. You need to remove these things from our lives. Friend, what have we elevated in our life that's above just seeking God? You can see God on a football field. You can see God uh, at a campground. You can see God in nature and all these things. It doesn't mean that you live this boring life. I forgot a hot pad, so I'm going to, I don't live a boring life, and I'm not going to grab this. I don't know if you, wow, that just smells amazing. It's my reward for preaching today, praise God. Isn't that, isn't that, Pastor Matt, doesn't that look good? I'd offer it to you, but they're kind of hot right now. You'll sacrifice, okay. I'll keep up here so they stay a little hot. Oh my gosh, I can just smell them. Stop. Right. <laughs> if I went around this room today, or, you know, we can have as many definitions for revival as there are the amount of people in here. Right? Revival is not a series of meetings that happen every year. Revival is when Christians return to the Lord with all their hearts. Revival as, as Duncan Campbell, who was the evangelist in the Hebrides Revival. He was, in 1949, he was sitting in a meeting in uh, London, and he was the keynote speaker. And as he was supposed to be up to speak, he was sitting off the side on a platform, and he leaned over to the, leader, the, the, the host and said, The Holy Spirit just spoke to me that I'm supposed to go to the Hebrides. And I'm supposed to leave now. And the guy's like, They're here because you're preaching. The guy's... Duncan Campbell said, I'm leaving. Got up, got on a train, showed up, and when he showed up, he, there was this set of women that were gathered there that had been praying and praying for revival and praying for Duncan Campbell to come to the Hebrides, which is on the west coast, uh, the fingerlings of the islands on the west coast of Scotland. As he took the train and he sat there and he's like, like, Lord, you brought me here for this. But let me tell you, as he began to preach, they, he was like, I'll preach tomorrow. And they're like, no, we've been waiting for you to come. So they gathered in the late nine hours and began to have services. And revival began to hit in that place to the point that people, the pubs would close down and people, when the pubs no longer were in existence because the people would not even go to them. They would come to the church. The judges had to put on white gloves because there was no more people breaking laws. See, when revival hits, it'll transform. Transform. Today, if you go back to the Hebrides, you wouldn't even know that the revival was there. Go to other places, you wouldn't even know that the revival was there. But there was this Duncan Campbell, who was this man, said, a community, a revival is a community saturated with God. You know, sometimes when it gets really humid outside, and you're like, oh, oh. That's saturation, the sky. I mean, the ground is all, you know, you walk on the grass and it's all like muddy and murky because the ground is saturated. Like in the air, you feel like, like what would that be like if that was the presence of God around us? And why couldn't it be? Why couldn't God move in such a way in your school that what is, what is being presented to you that is anti-God, actually God shuts the mouths of those others that are speaking those things. 
That truth actually rises up. Like when revival hits, it, it doesn't, you know, God wants to use man, but God will sleep into a room and do whatever he needs to do. Blowing with a breath of wind on the day of Pentecost and all the believers were baptized in the Holy Spirit. God can move in such a way that revival can begin to take place in so many different ways, but a community saturated with God. Vance Haber defines it, revival as a church falling in love with Jesus Christ all over again. Don't tell me you want the, 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 the things of God of Ross's day. Tell me I want the things that God has of this day. While we, we turn and we look back, we celebrate where God has brought us from, but, we, but our hope is not behind us. Our hope is in front of us. Amen. Henry Blackaby said, Revival is when God's people return to God and God returns to them and everyone sees a difference. Some of the great stories of the Brownsville Revival, the, the Playboy was in town doing a video show, a, a picture shoot for their magazine or whatever, and two Playboy buddies got in the, the, uh, at the beach, got in the, uh, the, the taxi, and I had said, take us to the happening place in town. You know where the taxi driver took them? <laughs> the Brownsville Revival to church. So you want, Thousands, millions of people from around the world have come to this place. Why wouldn't I take? He's like, I you know, he's like, you keep taking people to that place. Why wouldn't I take? That's the happening place. People would be driving down the road and their cars would turn into the into the church, or something would show up. Listen, there were prostitutes walking down the sidewalk in front of that church. It wasn't like it was in the best place in town. It was not a great place at all, but God chose to move in that place. Revival is when you and I return to where we really should have been all along. Revival happens in the heart, and when we put Jesus on the throne in our, and in our leadership of our life. Friends, revival happens when each person in the church has a heart for God and for His will. So many times we do not see revival because so many things, other things have taken our attention and our affections away from God. When the pattern is right, the glory will fall. Desire, definition. And the third element that we see here found in 1 Samuel 7 is the demand. What did God say for them to do? Remove the foreign gods and the astra from among you. Direct your hearts to the Lord and serve Him alone. God will place a demand on your life. He will place a demand on your finances. He will place a demand on your job. He will place, and I'm not saying a demand that will overwhelm you or overtake you for a negative. He will place a demand on you like the pressure of his hand upon your shoulder saying, I'm here, now what are you going to do with it? Right, dads, have you ever been with your, your boys and, and they got all this energy all the time and they're all in place and you just reach over and put your hand on their shoulder and they calm down in that moment because they recognize that dad, your presence is here. Sometimes the Lord just is going to do that in our lives and he's going to put his presence and his hands upon our shoulders just to say, I'm here. And the question is, what do we do with that? Do we cower and try to get out from underneath it? Or do we recognize that, hey, my dad's here. Now how do I respond? They were instructed to put away the strange things that they were worshiping, the idols and false gods. We must also put away anything that is in competition with God in our lives. God will not be satisfied to occupy a place alongside other things in our lives. You're married. You have your, your bride next to you. you. You don't have a girlfriend on the side, right? You're going to die in all ways. But that's what we do with Jesus. We're like, well, I'm going to have Jesus, I'm going to add him to my life, but then I can still have all this other stuff that's more valuable to me. 
See this? God demands that we prepare our hearts. He wants an exclusive... Uh, he'll, oh, he, God will not be satisfied to occupy, occupy a place along other side, other things in your lives. He wants an exclusive place in our lives. He demands that we prepare our hearts as we seek and respond to God. This means that we strive to make sure that the primary relationship in our life, our relationship with Jesus is right and it's healthy and that he is leading our life completely. A prepared heart is one that is tender and ready to receive the word of God and is willing to respond to what is heard. As Samuel said in chapter four, Lord speak, or in chapter three, Lord speak, for your servant is listening. If God speaks to you, are you willing to say, Lord speak, your servant is listening? And by that, I don't mean you're just listening. You're saying, I'm willing to go respond to what you're calling me to do. You serve the Lord by sharing as well what he is doing and helping us, helping others have an encounter with him. See, when the pattern is right, the glory of God will fall. And, and even as this is up, as you look at the tabernacle and you see the, the pattern of the, the tabernacle, how David, how they were supposed to, most of them were supposed to build it as it was being built, that the pattern was right, that the glory of God would occupy the Holy of Holies. You look through other places in Scripture, that the pattern is right. God's presence uh, would, would move. And I'm, I'm trying to remember my, I had marked another one that in my, um, in my notes. You would go to 1 Kings with Ahab and uh, with Elijah, and the pattern is right to put all the water on top of the, 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 the rocks and the wood, and all you can call upon God. And when there was a desire, and when there was a God, and there's the demands that were taking place, friends, those aren't the end. Because what happens is when we see revival come, it's not just about desire and definition, and it's not just about his demands, but we will see the glory when we see his deliverance. Some of you are walking around chained and bound to the things of this world. And God is saying, if you'll just follow my pattern, if you'll have a desire for me, and if you'll follow my, my the definition of what I want to do in your life, then just what does that mean to push in? If you'll give in to the, the demands that I'm calling you, not to hinder you, but to call you out. Friends, when we, when we become Christians, like, I don't drink, okay? I, I don't drink alcohol. I come from Wisconsin, and that's a... That's like another food group, okay? You go to all these festivals all summer long, and, and you got the priest and everybody else sitting next to you just drinking at the, the, at the bar and all this stuff. I mean, all, all these things, okay? And, and But I've chosen not to, because not because I'm, well, you're missing, I, I'm choosing, well, I'm, I'm missing out. No, it's because I choose that God, I know that God has something more. I don't need that. I don't need that in my life. I don't need that. God has something more. We need to see his deliverance. And what he says here at the end of verse 3, when you've followed his demands and give up, and it says the last portion of verse 3, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. The ark of God was stolen from the people of God. See, you have areas of your life that the devil has stolen from you. There are people that are no longer with you. There are decisions, there are finances, there are things that you said, man, God has been blessing and leading and paying me down. And today you can look back and those things are no longer there because the enemy's plan is to steal, to kill, and to destroy you. But it's time that we get a fresh desire. It's time that we know the definition. It's time that we follow his demands and get ready for our deliverance. Revival will, revival will deliver us from the bondage of sin, but it will also deliver us from the enemies of the gospel. We will see personal deliverance from sinful habits, carnal attitudes, and fleshly desires. Revival will help us to live the life of victory that we're called to live. Revival can bring deliverance to our church. We can be delivered of dead, dry religion, and from cold, apathetic ministry. I'm tired of showing up and it's just, it's just the normal, normal, normal. Like we should be ready. This is not normal. Normal is what we see in the book of Acts. 
of how the, the people of God are responding and how God's spirit, when the pattern is right, the glory will fall. Revival can bring deliverance to our community. Communities once consumed with sin, wickedness, and immorality can be transformed into communities of life, honor, and godliness. That there are videos of transformation happening in cities when the move of God takes place. See, revival will close down the false gentlemen's clubs and make those that attend them truly godly gentlemen. Revival can bring national deliverance. Only a sweeping move of God can deliver America from all the wickedness and worldliness that is consuming our land. Only a real heaven-sent revival could cause our nation to turn from its wicked ways and return to the Lord. Throughout revival, uh, throughout history, revival has changed the course and the destiny of individuals, of churches, of communities, and sometimes even entire nations. When the pattern is right, the glory will fall. These chocolate chip cookies turned out amazing. Friends, let's not 
not be satisfied. And some of you, you're not even going to go this far. You go to Dorothy Lane Market and get some of the cookies that Morgan's made. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. But you're, not, you're like, I'm not even going to turn on the oven. And some of us, that's how we treat God. This is my time. This is what I give you, God. This is mine. We do it with all aspects of our life. And if God demands anything outside of that, well, God, you're a loving God, and you'll, you'll forgive, and you'll allow this. But friends, are we satisfied with where we're at? See, I can, I can only want it, and, and, and we, can, you can, we can talk about it. But it's got to be a desire in your heart. It's got to be something that you want. And it goes back into our last week's sowing and reaping. It comes down to what are you sowing? Because that's what you're going to reap. If it's always I've got to, you know, get the clock and make sure it's all that. And friend, that's where it's, that's where our heart is. That's what we will reap. Our response is this: What does this look like? Revival. I, I, I'm not here to limit, and I'm not here to say fully, and, and I don't want to limit I, I, what I can define if you'll allow me to. Revival looks at a, looks like a hunger. It looks like what we saw this morning of the altar of people responding and saying, God, I, I'm, gonna, I'm leaving where I am and I'm coming after you. And saying, I'm, I'm surrendering myself at the altar. And, and, and there should never be, at some, any point, we should not grow weary of responding to the altar. And because there's, anytime there's a response, it's just saying, God, I want my heart to be open and tender to what you want to do. And, and, and sometimes it's like, sometimes you'll come down and you'll, you'll be at an altar and it just, it's, I was at the altar and I'm on the knees and I prayed or I've sat and done or worshiped or whatever. And, and, and sometimes it'll be like, God will speak to you in that moment. And I try to write those things down in my journal and try to keep them because I want to, I want to make sure that I'm responding and going to do what he wants me to do. But it's a, it's a release that some, sometimes I hate pews because it's like there's gates on the end of all these pews. And you feel like you're cramped up and you're contained, but God is saying, like, come on, let's go. Let it loose. Amen. Whether it's in worship or it's in time of, of at an altar time at the end of service. Yeah, sometimes we say, hey, we're going to have a clear cut of an uh, altar call, and maybe we all need to stay and, and participate in that. And sometimes it's like, hey, Carla, when you're done, go ahead and go. But when was the last time you just sat around an altar for a little bit? Some of you, you probably look around this room. You got, maybe, you know, when you're a little baby, your parents bring you, and you got your teeth marks are in some of these wood panels around here or something like that, you know, right? And you, you, had, or you slept underneath that pew, or you had all this because that's where you, you grew up in this place. There was a time when the church was, anytime the doors were open, it was full. Revival looks like this desire to push in and participate, not only in worship, but in prayer meetings. This Tuesday night, we're going to have prayer. And, and you, yeah, there's probably some great TV shows on them. And it may require you to make a little bit of adjustment to your, your meal plan at your house. But what would happen if you showed up and, 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 God, and God just spoke one word to you? Or in that moment in time, you just felt like one burden kind of lift from your shoulder. What would happen? <laughs> would you want that? Would you? And just say, and, and I'm not here to guilt you into it. I, I, I can't want more for you than what you want for yourself. If you're happy with where you are, praise God. Enjoy it. I'm not happy with what I'm at. And you can't change that in me. But I can change it in me. When God puts that hunger and desire in our spirit. Revival looks like our desires shifting. With the things that we used to satisfy us and bring us joy. Begin to shift and change where we desire to see his presence. There's a, a desire for his word. Now, I'll tell you, Wednesday night, we were, we were planning on doing this Wednesday. We'll have prayer Tuesday and this Wednesday night. Um, my plan was last week we were going to get in the church bus for those that were joining us for Wednesday night class. And we were just going to go to the uh, 
We're going to the school offices. We're going to go to the city offices. And we're just going to pray. And believe, God, would you move in our city? So we just believe God needs to, we want to see God move. We shift our desire. I got behind, I've been behind on my Bible reading. And so I've been reading two to three days a day because I need to get caught up. I'm trying to finish the month of April right now. Hey, anybody there with me? Is that all right to admit? Oh, pastor, you're pretty far behind. Sorry, I got a 34 on my, on my theology paper the other day and uh, 95 on my, yeah, 34 out of 35. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Got a, yeah, I got a 95 out of 100 on my uh, my thesis. So I'm like, okay, you know, you want in the study of the word, you look at those things, and now I get back in. And so in the morning, I find myself getting up and just reading, sitting in a drinking cup of coffee and reading through one day, and I may sit another time and do another day and those things. But the desire begins to shift. Yeah. There's a desire to get into God's word. There's a desire to be with God's people. A desire to be hungry. And I, Grant, I'm just going to invite you to come. And, and this morning, church, tonight, we're going to have a Pentecost service. And some of you are like, what's a Pentecost service? Really, what a, if anything, here's what it is. It's, there's about 12 churches out of the greater Dayton area that are coming together tonight. We're going to worship the Lord together. And we're going to just seek God. We want to, there's going to be preaching the word. We're going to. We're going to have worship and preaching, and we're going to have kids' ministry will be going on, but we have a desire to see God move in our community and in our region. And when all these churches come together to pray and to worship together, what can God do? This morning, I want to invite you to be here at 6 tonight for that. Don't worry if you have kids. We have full kids' ministry, so if that's your excuse, lame, lame, lame. I'm tired. I'm tired too. I want a vacation too. I, I, I want to sit at home and sit in my recliner tonight and drink an iced tea or lemonade or whatever. Arnold, Arnold Palmer, the two together, and watch some show on TV. I want to do that too. I don't want to have to come back tonight either. But I'm going to. Not only because we're hosting, but because. I'm expecting God to move. So, friends, what's your expectation? Satisfied? Or are you willing to go all the way in? This morning, we're just going to finish this way. I have one extremely long, and it's become a pattern that I really need to break. But I want to encourage you that if you want to go, you're free to go. If you want to stay a little bit and linger, I'm going to ask Grant to the TV. Grant's going to be back here at 4 o'clock before y'all. And so he was, he's here, and we're just asking him to play for a little bit and to lead and to sing. And I want to encourage you, just would you push in for a little bit? Your kids are going to be fine. We'll go over and get the kids. And if your kids aren't fine, we'll come and get, bring them to you. <laughs> and we'll give them sugar out the way. <laughs> Make sure you're here. Let's spend a little time today. Father, we thank you today. Why don't you stand up this morning? God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your moving. God, we thank you that you are speaking, still speaking to us today. Lord, today we just push in a little bit more. We hunger and thirst for you, God. Father, when the pattern is right, the glory will fall. God, we desire your glory to fall in our church. We desire you to move within our church. Would you come in power? Would you come in your presence? Would you come and shift the atmosphere in this place? Shift the atmosphere in our hearts and in our lives. God, we, we need you today. We need your presence. We desire you, God. Would you come and have your way? Friends, I want to invite you if you want to come and just worship for a little bit at the front, do so. When you're ready and feel dismissed, please dismiss yourself.